It's a normal day in the clinic. A patient who's been referred to you enters the office. You listen to him as he begins to explain his problem and you take his history in the process. The patient is a 70-year-old man with clear signs of fatigue. He has a history of smoking and was previously diagnosed with mild COPD. He's previously been prescribed short-acting bronchodilators to be used when needed. Your patient explains that for the last few weeks he's felt increasingly out of breath, for example after climbing the stairs. At night a cough has been troubling him, disturbing his sleep. Given this information, you're faced with a set of decisions to make. What's the patient's diagnosis? Is this an exacerbation of a COPD or an alternative diagnosis? How certain are you about the diagnosis? Will the patient require further testing to confirm your suspicions or to rule out other possibilities? And if you decide to carry out further testing, how will this affect your patient? If the tests are expensive or invasive, will the benefits of testing outweigh the burden? The uncertainty does not rest here. Even when you've reached a diagnosis, it might not be clear how your patient's health will progress and whether any medical intervention will be necessary to improve the patient's prognosis. And even when treatment is indicated, there may be several options. It may be that one of the available treatments is generally more effective than the others, but brings with it a greater risk of side effects. Selecting the best treatment for your patient becomes yet another challenge. When a patient enters a hospital with a set of complaints, we, the medical practitioners, have to use information from the patient as well as our own knowledge to determine what the patient's problem is and how we should proceed in order to lead our patient towards a favorable outcome. But what kind of information should we use to make decisions? And where does this knowledge come from? Before we start applying our knowledge in practice, it's important to realize that not all of the information we have in front of us is useful for clinical practice and some kinds of information are more valuable than others. One could base clinical decisions on a knowledge of disease mechanisms. If we understand how a disease works, perhaps this can help us to inform and treat our patient. But this kind of knowledge is often insufficient to answer complex medical problems, and it's often not directly relevant to the challenges of daily practice. Thinking back to our patient, a clear understanding of the underlying mechanisms of COPD cannot in itself help us reach a diagnosis or decide upon a treatment plan. Instead, traditionally, clinicians have used their own experiences as a basis for decision making. It might be that you've previously seen patients presenting with similar symptoms to our COPD patient, and you could base your decision on the results of what you've seen before. However, this approach is problematic because our experience are often limited, even if we're experts within a field, and therefore there's the potential for our judgments to be both subjective and biased. While we inevitably should use this kind of knowledge to make decisions for our patients, we often face challenges that cannot be solved by experience alone. Alternatively, we could base the judgments we make on evidence derived from clinical research. And this approach is gaining increasing recognition as a major cornerstone for decision-making in daily clinical practice. Provided that the information from clinical research is relevant and valid, an evidence-based approach will help to reach the most sound decisions. It should be emphasized that in daily practice, clinicians will not only base their decisions on the available scientific evidence pertaining to the problem at hand. In addition, they will use their clinical expertise as well as the preferences of patients. This is a complex process and clinicians commonly come across situations where confidently making a judgment that balances all of these factors can be difficult. If, in the example of the COPD patient introduced in this lecture, the scientific evidence indicates that this patient should undergo additional pulmonary function testing, your experience may tell you that, as in the past, this test will not, in all likelihood, add any diagnostic information for this particular patient, while the patient himself may tell you he'd really like to have the pulmonary test. Where does scientific evidence come from? 
And what can we do if there isn't any existing evidence from research related to our problem? We could decide to generate more evidence by designing and conducting a clinical epidemiological study. To do this, we generally collect information from hundreds or sometimes even thousands of patients that we can then use to synthesize new evidence in order to solve our clinical problem. While this may not help the patients sitting in your clinic right now, it could help you and other clinicians to make decisions for future patients. Epidemiology has traditionally focused on studying the causes of disease, and in recent years there has been a transition towards clinically relevant research. In clinical epidemiology, research always starts with a clinical problem that needs to be answered. It's then the role of the researcher to translate this problem into a question that can be studied using the methods and resources that are available. In the coming weeks, we'll be focusing on this problem of translation, which is really at the core of clinical epidemiology.